So thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks everyone for coming and thanks for the organizers for having me here. Um, I am going to be presenting a work that is joined with uh, Muli San, who is a graduate student at NYU and, and who's in the market this year. And our paper is on the role of firms in the assimilation. And by assimilation of immigrants here, I mean how as immigrants spend more time in their new country, their labor market outcomes gradually resemble more and more those of natives. So how might we expect firms to be related to immigrants' labor market assimilation? We can think of this through two different dimensions. The first one has to do with pay, and the second one has to do with non-pay aspects of jobs. So related to pay, we, we know that climbing the ladder of good paying jobs is something that takes time. And immigrants might face different barriers to climb this ladder compared to natives. So one example uh, has to do with networks. Existing literature has shown how social and uh, professional networks are an important source of labor market opportunities. And presumably immigrants arriving to a new country might, like, might lack these types of connections on arrival and gradually build them up over time. A second example has to do with mobility constraints. Different countries might have the regulations uh, that in some cases limit immigrants' uh, job mobility. But of course, workers do not only care about pay and they value other aspects of jobs, uh, such as amenities, employer-provided benefits, job security, or their types of co-workers, among, among other things. So focusing only on assimilation of pay, uh, we could miss out on, on these uh, important aspects. So this might lead us to, to ask, what is the degree of assimilation in non-pay firm characteristics that might be associated with this type of, of job aspects? And in terms of related literature, there is quite a bit of evidence on firms' importance and on the heterogeneous impacts that firms can have on workers' pay and on, on wage inequality overall. There's also quite a bit of work on immigrants' assimilation, uh, but relatively speaking, there's quite a few work that, that connects uh, these, these two things. So in this paper, we're going to ask, what is the role of heterogeneous firms in immigrants' assimilation? We are going to do this in, the, in a context of a historical mass migration episode. So around during the 1990s, close to 1 million Jews from the former Soviet Union moved to Israel. And, and this move was triggered by the Soviet Union unexpectedly uh, relaxing immigration restrictions and Soviet Jews fleeing the, the collapse of the Soviet Union and long-standing anti-Jewish discrimination present, present there. We're going to be able to study this, this remarkable historical episode using population and employee employee data from, from Israel that it covers from the mid 1980s up until 2015. And crucially, these data are going to include for everybody, uh, we're going to observe the place where, where somebody is born. And if they were born outside of Israel, the year in which they arrived to Israel. So we're going to be able to identify these this, this immigrants. And using this data, we're going to study the contribution of firm heterogeneity to immigrants' labor market assimilation. And we're going to focus on the role of firm-specific pay premiums, sorting and employment segregation across firms, and assimilation in non-pay firm characteristics. So let me now briefly summarize what our, our main findings are. We, we find that on arrival, immigrants are initially employed at segregated, young, small, and low-paying firms. So for example, one year after arrival, uh, immigrants are, receive, are working at firms that have 10% low wage premiums that firms employing natives. Also one year after arrival, we see that immigrants are working in firms that are on average three times smaller than natives. And then these patterns are slowly uh, reversed. And after 18 years in Israel, we find that immigrants actually start working at better paying firms than natives. And to interpret these results, it's important to, to keep in mind how uh, immigrants in, the, in, in this uh, context from the former Soviet Union that came to Israel were very highly educated compared to natives. Um, I'm having some trouble with my screen. One second. One second. Sorry about this. 
Okay, I think I need to share my screen back again. Okay, there we go, sorry about that. So the next thing that we find related to earnings is that there is a large initial immigrant native wage gap, which gradually closes and is finally practically closed after 25 years uh, of immigrants arrival. And tying these two things together, we find that sorting into high and low paying firms actually explains a, a substantial fraction of uh, the, this pay gap. So for example, ones that we compare uh, the overall wage gap with the within firm wage gap, which is the wage gap that arises when we compare immigrants and natives who are working in the same firms, we find that this within firm uh, gap is 32 to 34% smaller than the overall gap. And this is one to 10 years after arrival when, when the gap is largest. And finally, also related to, to sorting, we find that the firm specific pay premiums can account for a significant fraction of the gap, in particular between 10 to 12% uh, one to 10 years after arrival. So in terms of related literature, we, we believe we contribute to three, three main strands of literature. There is a fast growing literature on the role of firms in the labor market, showing how heterogeneous firms can have important impacts on workers' pay and, 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 and inequality in the labor market. And of course, there is a long-standing literature that has studied immigrants' labor market assimilation. And this literature has mostly focused on, on earnings and occupations, uh, with, without studying so much the role of uh, firms and employers. And the most relevant exceptions here are this paper by uh, Damas de Matos and this recent paper by Dostienal, which also use employer and pre -da uh, match data to study uh, assimilation. This one is in Portugal and this one is in Canada. And then finally, we're not the first in the, in the economics literature to study this important historical episode. There are several papers that have studied this migration episode, mostly focusing on the effect uh, on, on natives or assimilation on earnings and, uh, and, and also on residential locations of immigrants within Israel. These papers have mostly used survey data and we're gonna be able to use this new data on uh, the population of Israel during, during this episode to focus on the employer side of, of this episode. Okay, so now let me tell you a little bit about the historical context. So in 1989, the Soviet Union and ex quite unexpectedly relaxed immigration restrictions and Soviet Jews started to leave the country massively. And Israel was the only country which accepted them unconditionally on arrival and also on arrival granted them citizenship. This resulted in, in, in a vast outflow uh, going from the Soviet Union to Israel. So, so that you can get an idea of the magnitude of this shock between 1989 and 1999, around over 800,000 uh, former Soviet Jews migrated to Israel. And we're talking about a country which in 1989 had a population of around 4.5 million. So this was a very large shock. And in the early years alone, the, between 1989 and 1991, around 345,000 people arrived, which represented uh, close to 8% of Israeli population back then. This figure here puts this, this migration shock in context with some numbers. Is, this is plotting the number of people who, uh, since 1948 up until 2015, migrated from the Soviet Union or the former Soviet Union to Israel. And we can see that there was one migration episode in the 1970s. Then after that, the, board, the Soviet Union uh, was uh, restricted immigration uh, a lot after that again. And then this is the migration shock that we're studying here. So you can see that in 1990, there was an unprecedented peak of over 170,000 arrivals. And then this uh, very large uh, flow persisted throughout the 1990s and then it started to decline afterwards. To get some more perspective, this figure here is plotting that the, the, the migration flow from Israel, so, sorry, from the former Soviet Union to Israel. And then this green line is showing all migration uh, coming into Israel in the same time period. And, and you can see, first of all, that uh, during the years of this migration episode, it represented uh, a very, very high share of total migration. So this was, uh, so this is what is represented here in this dashed line. And the levels themselves were quite unprecedented and only comparable to, to the to a large number of people arriving to Israel when, when the state was founded. So 
uh, in spite of, of, of the size of the shock, previous uh, research has found that, that if there were any negative effects on natives' wages, they were modest and short-lived or, or none at all. There are some, some differences in what this research finds. And as I was saying, on arrival, these immigrants were, uh, became Israeli citizens and as, and as such, they were able to enjoy the, the social benefits that everybody else would be able to enjoy. And they also had unrestricted residential and employment uh, choices. They received uh, assistance from the state that was quite comprehensive and it included non-monetary things such as free Hebrew classes. Uh, but uh, the support in terms of income was modest, which, which meant that migrants needed jobs very shortly after arrival. And as I quickly mentioned before, it's important to keep in mind that immigrants that came to Israel from the former Soviet Union were very highly educated. Uh, overall, and in particular relative to the Israeli population at the time. So for example, among prime age men, 30% of, uh, of these immigrants had a college degree compared to 17% of Israelis, or 70% uh, of immigrants had back in the Soviet Union a, a middle or high skill occupation uh, compared to around 30% of Israelis. But of course, on arrival to Israel, it has been well documented that there was a lot of occupational downgrading that, that took time for immigrants to, to, to climb. Uh, yes. May I ask you a clarification question? Did they typically speak the language when they arrived? No, they typically did not. And it was a huge barrier. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Some Thank of them you. learned, but others uh, not, not so much. Okay, if there are no more questions on the very brief historical context, let me now tell you about the data that we use and some, some stylized facts. So as I was saying, we're using population administrative records from Israel that, that arise from combining two main data sets. The first is a match employee employee records that uh, span the, the mid 80s up until 2015. And here you can find the, the, the type of things that we usually find in this type of records, things such as person and firm identifiers, the firm in which each worker works in any given month and measures of, uh, of yearly salary. Then this data, we're able to link it to the Israeli population registry, which is going to give us a, a, a rich set of demographics for, for workers. And, and crucially for our purposes, we're going to observe a, a, any given person's country of birth. And if this country was uh, different from Israel, the date in which they arrived to Israel. And then we are able to observe some things that we're not using right now, but we could uh, possibly use such as family links or neighborhood of residence uh, later on. Given that uh, we want to study uh, labor market assimilation that is comparing immigrants to natives, we're going to take this population level data and we're going to construct a sample, which is what we're going to base everything I show you today, which, in which we're going to consider all the former Soviet Union's immigrants and we're going to compare them against a 25% random sample of non-Arab, non-ultra-Orthodox uh, native Israelis. So the first thing that we want to do with this data is... is, I may? is yes. May I uh, convey another clarification question? Yes, yes, of course. Uh, are there issues with irregular migration in the data set? And are the years of arrival real? Could you uh, repeat the first question? I didn't get the first one. Uh, it's basically a question whether there were any issues with irregular migration and if this is in your data set. Okay, so, so yeah, that's a good question. So as I said, um, Israel welcomed and actively tried to attract these immigrants from the Soviet Union. And on, on account of uh, being Jewish, they were allowed to come without any type of restrictions. and on arrival, they became Israeli citizens. So there was no irregular migration. The opposite, actually, the state tried to attract all these immigrants. And then on arrival, like from, from minute one, they enjoyed the same uh, rights and, uh, as, as any other Israeli citizen. So you, you, don't, you wouldn't have this, this issue of, of uh, immigrants that do not have the right to work like in other contexts. And then, okay. the, as, and then the second question, the date of arrival is, is, is actually the date in which they arrived to the country. It's not inferred from labor market histories. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an administrative record when somebody uh, migrated into the country. Okay, thank you very much, Jaime. Uh, 
Yeah, no problem. Thanks. Uh, okay, so so we we start out by trying to 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 document some evidence that 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 addresses two questions. Uh, on and that both are related to the allocation of such a large immigrant shocks to to firms. And the first one is how did such a large inflows immigrant was allocated between existing firms and newly created firms that were born in, in the midst of this uh, very large migration shock. And then the second question that we ask is how segregated was immigrants employment across firms? Was it the case that immigrants found employment in uh, uh, across all types of firms in the in the economy together with natives or is it the case that they were concentrated in, 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 a, in a given set of firms so in terms of the first question using our our, our population level data we are able to uh, quantify the number of new firms that are created in any given year and this is what we're plotting in this figure from 1989 about 2015. And you can see that this range is, broadly speaking, between 15,000 and 25,000 firms. And if you plot a quite naive time trend between before the shock and, and, and the year 2000, you can see that uh, during the 1990s, there is this lump here that we call excess mass of firm creation during the, during the 1990s. And the, the peak of uh, this, this excess mass is, is around, roughly speaking, around 5,000 firms. And of course, uh, an immediate question that comes up is, well, how much of this firm creation was, was actually created by, by the immigrants themselves? And unfortunately, our data does not include firm ownership, but we are able to create a proxy of how, of how likely a firm is to be a, a firm created by uh, former Soviet Union immigrants. Essentially, we look at how many of the firms had a very high share of former Soviet Union employees at the time of firm birth. And then we are plotting uh, the number of new firms that, that, that satisfy this condition for different cutoffs. So this dark line here, for example, plots the number of new firm births, which at birth were exclusively, had exclusively uh, employees were former Soviet Union immigrants. And then these other lines show different, uh, different definitions. So this one plots firms that had 75% or more of the employees from Soviet Union immigrants, and this one were half or more were former Soviet Union immigrants. And once that you compare these trends with, uh, with, with this one, you can see that, yes, of course, there was a lot of firm creation that, that can be directly linked uh, to, to the immigrants themselves. But if you compare the magnitudes, even the, the most lenient definition of, of former Soviet Union firm the peak is around 2,000 firms, whereas here we saw it was like 5,000. So it cannot all be explained uh, by, by the immigrants creating firms themselves. And then this is another metric that we look at. Uh, we ask how many of, so here we're just plotting this for the first arrival cohort and then we're able to follow them all the time. And we're asking how much of this first arrival cohort uh, was employed at a new firm uh, where a new firm, we, we denote one that is less than five years old. And we can see that on arrival, a, a very high share of immigrants were employed in new firms. Uh, this is uh, over what, like over 30%. And this slowly declines as they, they move to more established firms or the firms in which they're employed, they, 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 they become more established themselves. And by 2015, we can see that only around 12% of, of this cohort is employed in, in new firms. I may. May yes. I ask some more clarification questions, please? Yes, yes, uh, so yes. one question is about the type of information or what information you have on business characteristics and on job type mm -hmm. in your data. Mm -hmm. Yes. And then, so, uh, okay, mm -hmm. you go with that first. Yeah. Yeah. So, so if I remember correctly, we have information on industry of a given firm. And then by, by virtue of serving all of their workers, we can aggregate up some characteristics related to their workforce, such as size uh, or when it was created. Uh, but I think that beyond observing all of its workers and, and the industry, we do not know much more about them. Okay, thank you. There is one more question also related to the firms. Namely, mm -hmm. if there are many micro firms with, for example, only one employee in the data set, 
Yes, that's. Uh, I do not have a, a number right off the top of my head, but for sure uh, there there must be quite a few of them, and I and I believe that we're including them in everything that I'm showing. So uh, an alternative would be to show something along these lines that separates how much of these is explained by very very small verbs like the one you described. Yeah. Okay, thank, thank you. you. And then uh, one last one, and then we will let you continue. It, the, this question is around, so is, is about your data set, basically whether you account for attrition in the data set. So the question here is whether the observed salary convergence over time may not simply be the result of self-selection of immigrants, because some may settle permanently in Israel. Hmm. Uh, because they have easily assimilated, while others who could not assimilate um, might have um, a higher probability to return? That's a, that's a very good question. Um, from, so from, from, from a reading of the historical evidence, there, there was, most of them moved to stay. It's of course, some didn't, but it, uh, most of them moved with the intention of staying for, for a long time. Then in terms of what we do later on, we are, I mean, this descriptive, um, this descriptive analysis is, is not adjusting for attrition. Later on, in, in some of the analysis we do on earnings and earnings assimilation, we'll explicitly take into account, do, we will do many within person comparisons that hopefully uh, account for this type of possible, possible uh, self selection. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Okay, finally, in terms of employment segregation, uh, the metric that we compute is 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 to say well again focusing on the on the on the first arrival cohort of 1990, uh, we ask how much of this cohort is employed in firms where 50 percent of more of the workforce is made up of uh, former Soviet Union immigrants, and again we see that uh, in the in the early years a very large fraction of this cohort was employed in such firms essentially surrounded by other uh, Soviet Union immigrants this is close to 75% of them and this number slowly declines as their time in arrival increases and uh, all and decreases all the way all the all the way up to 25% okay so now let me move on to talk about assimilation in earnings and the way that we're studying earnings is through the lens of uh, an augmented AKM model. So this is going to be a, a model of wages in which the log monthly wage of a given person I in a, in, a, in a year T is going to be a function, a flexible function of time since arrival, which this is going to be, uh, this is going to be for, for immigrants, time since arrival to Israel. Then we're going to have uh, an unobserved uh, individual persistent component, a firm's pay premium. So this is the pay premium of firm J, which is the firm that uh, person I is employed at time T. And then we're also going to uh, be controlling for time and age effects. And these pay premiums are going to play an important role in, in what we do. So I'm gonna talk a little bit more about, about them. There are two different wage setting models that can result in this type of uh, wage specification. Uh, we're not going to take a strong stand of which one applies in our case, and it's not going to be important to interpret our findings, but this might give some useful context. So we, you can think of a rent sharing model, in which case these CJs are going to be a combination of uh, worker surplus share and from J's average March surplus. An alternative model that has been proposed for this type of uh, uh, Wage models is a monopsonistic wage setting model, in which case these firm premiums are some combination of a labor supply parameter times firm J's value added per worker. Again, we're not going to take a strong stand because it doesn't really impact our findings, but it, let's just keep in mind that, that both instances, uh, you can think of CJs as being closely tied to firm's productivity, apart from, of course, uh, the pay that workers at those firms enjoy. And in terms of existing evidence, uh, other papers have shown how these pay premiums are correlated with things such as firm profitability, firm survival, and firm size. There's also work that has shown that these this pay premiums are highly persistent. And in terms of wage gaps, other than the immigration, uh, immigrant native wage gap, uh, other papers have shown that uh, sorting into firms with high or low pay premiums can explain around 20% of the Portuguese gender wage gap, or also around 20% of the racial uh, wage gap in, in Brazil. 
Okay, so uh, with through the lens of this uh, wage model, we're going to think of different earnings assimilation statistics. And the first one of them are going to be traditional in the sense that we're going to be comparing immigrants to natives. And the first one is going to be the immigrant native wage gap simply as a function of time since arrival. We're going to call this MN, so immigrant native. And you can think of this as simply the difference in average wages between immigrants and natives as a function of time since arrival for immigrants. And once that we, that we look at this statistic and we interpret it through our wage model, this is going to be a function of first, uh, what we call this non-firm uh, assimilation, which is uh, time since arrival effects that do not have to do with, with, uh, with firms uh, pay premium. Then there are going to be baseline differences between the unobserved person effects of immigrants and natives. And then there's this term here, which we call firm assimilation. And this is the average pay premium that immigrants enjoy at different points in time compared to the, um, the pay premium that natives enjoy. The second type of statistic that we're going to consider is what we call the within firm uh, immigrant native wage gap. And this is going to be similarly defined as the first one, but we're going to further going to condition on the type of firm that somebody is employed. So we're going to compare the average wages of immigrants and natives as a function of time since arrival for immigrants, but for immigrants and natives who are working in the same type of firm. And this is going to have the following components. It's going to have the, the same non-firm assimilation component. And then the, the difference in average uh, person components is going to be uh, immigrants and natives, but for those immigrants and natives who are in the same type of firm. The way that we estimate these two statistics is quite straightforward. The first one uh, are going to be the betas in this uh, wage equation in which for immigrants, uh, we have one different beta for each uh, time since arrival. And then we're just going to adjust for age and time effects when comparing this against natives. And then the, the, the within firm wage gap is going to be a very similar regression with the difference that we're also going to be including firm fixed effects. So the idea is to compare two people, two persons who are in the same type of firm. And this figure here shows our estimates of these two assimilation statistics. The gray line shows the coefficients of the, the overall wage gap. And the orange line shows the, the within firm wage gap. So focusing first on the gray one, we see that uh, one year after arrival, there's a pretty large wage gap. There is around uh, 0.8 lock points. And then gradually, uh, this gap shrinks and shrinks more, fa uh, more faster in the, in the first 10 years since arrival, but then gradually keeps on closing. And after 25 years in Israel, the gap is, is practically closed. When we compare this against the within uh, firm wage gap, we see that the within firm wage gap is, is substantially smaller than the overall wage gap. In particular, it's between 32 to 34% smaller during the first 10 years. So this is already a first indication that the sorting into different types of firms is, is an important part of, of, of what's going on in the overall wage gap. The two other assimilation statistics of earnings that we're going to consider are uh, a bit different in, and they're going to try to, 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 to interpret the earnings gap in a different way in that we're going to do immigrant to immigrant comparisons. So the idea here is that by, by controlling for person fixed effects, the thought experiment that we want to do is to compare somebody against themselves once that they have spent 25 years in the country. And this is what we're going to call the within immigrant wage gap as a function of time since arrival, where the benchmark is whatever the wage is at after 25 years in the country. And through the interpreting this or wage model, this is going to include what we call non-firm self-assimilation. Again, compared against uh, this, this effect at, eight, at 25 years since arrival. And then this other component, which is firm self-assimilation, which says, how good is the pay premiums that a given immigrant receives as a function of time since arrival compared to the type of firm where they're employed after 25 years. And the last assimilation statistic we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna consider is the within immigrant wage gap within firm as well. So this is simply 
uh, going to be a comparison of a given person against themselves for the 25 years, taking into account that they might work in different types of firms, and all that's going to be left in this type of uh, simulation statistic is what we have called the non-firm self-assimilation. And the way to estimate this, uh, this additional simulation statistics is, is, is quite similar as before. The only important difference here is that now we're going to be including uh, this person fixed effect. So everything is going to be comparison within a given person. And finally, in the last assimilation statistic, this is going to be the, the equation, which is going to be uh, an augmented uh, two-way fixed effect, AKM style type of regression, where we uh, uh, allow for flexible time series arrival patterns, person fixed effects, and firm fixed effects. And this uh, blue and green lines represent the immigrant to immigrant uh, simulation statistics in comparison to, to the immigrant to natives that I just showed you before. Um, so for example, when we consider the blue line, we see that compared to themselves after 25 years, uh, immigrants are earning uh, less like over 0.25 lock points uh, since arrival. So it's a substantial gap that they cl slowly close, uh, especially during the first 10 years and then more gradually after that. Once that we account for, for firm mobility that we condition on the type of firm where a given immigrant is, uh, the, the, the within immigrant, within person wage gap is around 28% smaller than the overall wage gap. And we see that actually the non-firm assimilation component is almost practically zero after 10 years uh, in Israel. Okay, so in the last few minutes, uh, let me now move from assimilation in earnings and then directly study assimilation in firm, in firm attributes. The idea here is that we want to understand how different are firms that employ immigrants compared to firms that employ natives. And we are going to, in a similar vein as with earnings, we're going to study firm assimilation comparing immigrants and natives. And we're going to study firm self-assimilation comparing immigrants and immigrants after 25 years since arrival. And the idea here is that we're going to look at firm characteristics directly as outcomes. So if, if uh, pi j is some characteristics, some, some characteristics of firm j, where somebody is employed at, at time t, we're going to compare the average firm characteristics for immigrants as a function of time since arrival compared to the average firm characteristics for natives. And the same goes when uh, comparing immigrants to themselves after 25 years in Israel. And we're going to study three uh, firm attributes. Uh, the pay premiums that I was just describing before, these CJs that we can estimate in a previous step and now we can uh, analyze them directly. And we're also going to consider firm size and firm, firm age. And the motivation here is that these are firm characteristics that are correlated uh, with the type of non-pay uh, job uh, aspects that I was describing before. And in particular, with respect to firm size, there's a lot of literature that shows how this is correlated um, with productivity, with uh, quality of co-workers and job training and, other, and many other things. So how does this look? Uh, these two assimilation statistics when we look at firms pay premiums. Uh, the gray line shows the immigrant to native comparison of uh, pay premiums and the blue line shows the immigrant to immigrant uh, assimilation. And what the gray line tells us is that one year after arrival, immigrants are employed in firms that pay around 10% lower pay premiums. And as a result of firm mobility moving for up to higher paying firms, uh, immigrants compared to natives gradually climb the ladder of good paying jobs and around 18 years, 18 to 19 years after arriving, they, they actually surpass uh, natives in this metric and they start to be employed in, in firms that pay higher pay premiums compared to natives. And then the blue line shows a, a within immigrant comparison, which by definition ends up at zero at uh, after 25 years in the country, but you see that even comparing within within immigrant, there's still quite a lot of firm mobility that goes from around uh, minus 0.8 lock points uh, and slowly catches up uh, in quite a persist, uh, consistently all the way up until 25 years after arriving to the country. 
we can do a similar thing for firm size. And the, the, what we find is, some, is somewhat similar. Uh, the gray line shows that on arrival, immigrants were employed in firms that were much smaller than natives. So these lock points traduce into around three times smaller. And again, gradually, they are employed in larger and larger firms. And after 18 to 19 years, they're actually employed in firms that are larger than those employed natives. And then the blue line tells us a similar story, but doing the comparison within uh, immigrants. And finally, we look at, uh, at firm age and we look at the dummy variable, which indicates whether a person is working at a new firm. And as before, we're defining a new firm as a firm that is five years uh, old or, or less. And what we see is that on arrival, immigrants are much more likely to, to work at new firms that uh, were created uh, five years ago or less. And gradually they move uh, to more established firms. And after 10 years, uh, they are actually somewhat less likely to be working uh, in new firms. And something similar, uh, something similar comes up when we do within immigrant comparisons, saying that immigrants gradually move to more established firms. Okay, so that's uh, all that we have. Uh, let me now conclude with, with some, some final thoughts. We think that, that we are doing a nice combination by being able to study this remarkable historical mass migration episode with modern uh, administrative and pro-employee data that also allows us to uh, observe immigrants for a long period of time since arrival. For those who arrived the earliest, uh, we're able to observe them for uh, 25 years. And we document, uh, broadly speaking, how firms are an important part of immigrants' labor market assimilation. We have shown that uh, there is a gradual sorting of immigrants into higher paying firms and also bigger firms and more established firms. And that this sorting into higher paying firms explains a, a significant fraction of the catch up in wages, uh, in particular uh, between 10 to 12% in the, in, the, in the years with the largest gaps. And in this particular historical episode that, uh, uh, where, where immigrants have um, very high levels of education, we see that there's actually a reversal and eventually immigrants are working in better paying firms than the, 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 the comparison natives. And as I, as I mentioned, we also show uh, an important assimilation in terms of non-pay firm characteristics that we think might be correlated with valuable uh, non-pay job aspects such as segregation from size or from age. So as, as, as a concluding thought, we, we think that this shows that firm to firm mobility is an important path for immigrants labor market success. And I just wanted to mention something to point out is that we have studied a context which is very special in that uh, newly arrived immigrants uh, face no labor market restrictions in terms of regulations or, or, or laws that, that prevented them from moving around as they pleased. Uh, but this is not always the case. So, so this, this, this might be uh, useful to keep in mind and policy relevant when thinking about other cases in which employer sponsor type of visa programs actually very explicit limit firm to firm mobility for for immigrants in their in their new countries and that's all i have thank you very much for for attending and i and i look forward to to your questions thank you very much jaime for this great presentation i think this is an extremely extremely interesting topic so i'm sure we're going to have um many questions today um, please, all participants, just raise your virtual hand uh, if you have a question or type in the Q&A section and then we will, we will give you the floor. Um, we have one open comment in the Q&A section by Salvatore. Salvatore asks, how many workers compare only one year in a data set? So how much of the data set is unbalanced? Um, how much of the data set is unbalanced? I, maybe, sorry, I don't understand the question. Maybe we could ask Salvatore if he wants to um, unmute himself and then ask the question. Salvatore, would you like to? Yes, I'm here. Do you hear me? Yes, I can. Hi, Salvatore. Hi, hi. 
My, hi, no. Yes, uh, now my question was that to use uh, um, an AKM model. So basically, um, use a, an individual fixed tax, but if you have only uh, an individual in you know, one year, I think uh, that individual disappears from the data set. And so if you have uh, um, some individuals that appear in the data set only twice, three times per year, maybe these individuals uh, 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 um, there is a selection of individuals that stay in Israel and uh, with respect to people that go in Israel after moving from um, the ex-Soviet Union and then and thereafter move to another country. Uh, maybe there is this selection of migrants. What do you think about? Yeah, so that's a good question. So uh, let me say a, a few things. You're right that then, then in the um, in the last type of assimilation statistic that we look at, uh, which is essentially an AKM type of regression, there are this, the, 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 it's very demanding on data. Uh, we have a few things in our favor. One of that is that we have a very long panel. Uh, so it's, uh, we have like, it's like a 25 years panel. And then something else that we have in our favor is that the migration shock was, was actually huge. So if we had a very small migration shock, we would have a, a harder time estimating uh, the AKM model uh, with the person fixed effects and the firm fixed effects. Uh, I do not have a number off the top of my head of how many people we only observe uh, once. That's something that we could compute. But again, my sense is that given the nature of the migration episode uh, in which the vast majority of people came to stay and the fact that we have a very long panel, uh, it shouldn't be a very a very big problem, but we could we could compute uh, th those numbers to, to have a better sense. Thank you, Hanna. Thank you. Yeah, I have a question as well. So I was wondering, I mean, I thought it was very interesting what you showed on the firm creation side. So I was wondering whether you did more to explore whether, for instance, the sectors in which the firms were created were more mm. similar to the sectors of uh, the ex-Soviet Union. And also when you're saying that um, workers move to firms that are more productive, is there also an effect that these newly created firms become more productive over time? And so that for, uh, workers do not really move, but they stay in firms that themselves uh, start to pay better. Yes, that's a, that's a very good question. So questions. So let's see on the sectors, that's actually a very good idea. We haven't done it. Also, I forgot to say, this is still pretty much work in progress. So any comments, suggestions like this are very much appreciated. And yes, it will be interesting to see the, the types of sectors in which this firm creation is occurring. And, and, and that's something we could do. Um, and then your second question, yes. So, so we actually do not have a measure of productivity. What we have on the one hand is our, our pay premium estimates, which by definition, they're fixed in time. Uh, so we cannot do that. We do have firm size, which many people use as a, as a different proxy for productivity. And indeed, uh, we, that's something that we could study how it evolves over time uh, for, for, the, for the different types of, of new firms that, that I was showing. So, so those are, thanks because those are nice suggestions. Um. Right, thank you very much. We have a question by Jesus. Jesus, please feel free to ask your question. Hello, thank you. Thanks for, for a very interesting presentation. So I, yeah, I, I would definitely encourage you as uh, previous interventions to, to look at uh, the role of selective out-migration, mm. which if I understood correctly, you, you didn't look at yet. Uh, even if uh, I think you might be right in your intuition that it's not a big deal in this issue, in this uh, example. And then the other question I had was about the, the um, uh, increase in productivity by, uh, by the migrants themselves over time. So how does your framework account for that? Is this include, included in, the, in your XIT controls? So if, if, a, if an immigrant gets uh, on the job training or more education, how does uh, the, the wage equation that you're estimating account for that. Thanks. Mm 
Thanks, Jesus, for your questions. Um, yeah, I agree. We, the the out migration thing is something that we should study. We also have on our list to to, to see if the patterns that I showed you are different for different arrival cohorts. Uh, so so yeah, there, we still have quite a bit of work to do on on, on those dimensions. Um, and then on your question. So so I, I, thanks for that question because I I was very fast and and that was I think that's a good way of uh, motivating, let me go back very quickly, in the assimilation in earnings. So this component here, which essentially is the, um, the, the, the time since arrival effects that are not directly related to the types of firms in, in which somebody is working. In my, that's uh, the way we're thinking about it is that they are capturing precisely the things that you are saying. Things such as learning Hebrew, adapting better to the uh, Israeli labor market or training that it's uh, important for the Israeli labor market and all, all, all of those things we believe that are captured by this term. And then different estimates of our different assimilation statistics. We, if, if, if you're particularly interested in that term, then we can back them out from different assimilation statistics. And in the very end, the last one that we estimate, the, the more uh, restrict, the, the more uh, saturated one, the within immigrant, within firm assimilation statistic uh, specifically captures uh, this 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 term uh, it's 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 normalized by that after 25 years and you can see that this is the green line here that the vast majority of, of catch up for this component occurs in the first 10 years okay thanks okay so in principle you uh, you could try to decompose this uh through the effect on different observables. So relate these terms to, I, I don't know, improvements in education or uh, specific human capital, things like this. Yes, that would be great, but we do not observe, um, we do not observe that, that those type of things in our data. Uh, we do not, do, we importantly, we do not observe uh, education. Uh, yeah, but I agree, that would be, that would be interesting. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Next on the list is Felix. Please feel free to talk. Hi. Um, yeah, thanks for this interesting presentation. Um, so part of this um, story um, is also like um, migrant downgrading, like the I was thinking about the papers by Dustman, that they take lower skill jobs. And you don't have this data, but you, you could maybe try to take a look at the occupations, like the switches between occupations, and see if that also has an effect. Yes, that's yeah, thank you. Thanks. Not sure if that's clear, but but I would would be interesting for me to see if um, those who switch more between occupations assimilate mm -hmm. faster. Yes, that's uh, thanks, Felix. That, that's a that's a great point. And let me be straightforward. We do not observe occupations in this data set. Uh, there is so the previous work that I was mentioning before using survey data has already done a pretty good job in, in documenting this this initial occupational downgrading and 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 subsequent catch up in terms of, of, of occupational and, and higher skill occupations. The nice thing about this data is that we can examine this this new angle focusing on employers, but unfortunately, we cannot study both at the same time because we do not see occupation. I think that going back to to Sarah's question, however, it would it might be interesting as a you know as a similar not similar but as a related analysis, we could study industry uh, industry switches. Um, how much of this catch up is associated with uh, moving across industries. Um, but yeah, the, the short answer is that we do not see occupation. Yeah, sorry, I, I meant industry with occupation. Yes, industry, yes, that's a good, yeah. So industry, we could, we could, uh, we could examine how much of, of uh, the catching up is, is associated with moving, moving across industries, yeah. Thanks. Hey, thank you. Next is uh, Jeremy. Please feel free to ask your question. 
Hi, um, so this is, this is actually related to the last question, but you know, I'm wondering if you can say a bit more about what is driving this friction. So why, why is it taking time for migrants to sort into uh, higher paying jobs? And, mm -hmm. you, know, you know, is it, you mentioned language barriers might be relevant, is relevant here. So, you know, is it language barriers? Is it driven by other frictions, things that require more regional knowledge maybe? Um, and so I guess another way of asking that is, can you look not just at, um, you know, how much is movement across industries driving this, but which movement into which industries? Um, you know, maybe you can look at industries that require more communication intensive uh, tasks. Mm -hmm. it, it might be hard to do if you don't see occupation, mm -hmm. but I'm wondering if you thought about this. So, so yeah, no, that's a great question. And uh, yeah, so language would be one. Another one uh, might be, I mentioned this in the introduction, it, it, it might be related to, to networks. Uh, there are many papers that show that a lot of job finding comes from the people that you know. And, and as an immigrant in a new country, you might know less people, especially in less uh, in the high paying firms. And this might change over time. Uh, it could do with, uh, with geographical location, something that I didn't mention, but that, that it has been shown is that there was quite a lot of moving around uh, in the early years. So it might be that it takes time to move from a place in which there are less uh, good jobs to, to one in which there are more. In terms of what we could actually do uh, to study these different channels. Um, so in terms of language, we, that's a that's a nice suggestion to, I, I agree with you. Ideally we would have occupations, but in the absence of occupation, maybe we can come up with some sort of industry uh, industry level measure of how important our communication skills. Uh, that's actually very nice and we should think about that. Uh, what uh, we had in our to-do list that our data allows us to do quite well and is and this is related to, to Muli's other work is, is to look at the role of networks. Uh, we have a pretty good idea of what are these immigrants uh, professional networks as, as their time in Israel evolves. So, um, so yeah, that, that's something that we, we wanted to explore more. Thanks, it's really interesting. So I look forward to seeing that. Thank you. Hey, thank you. And next is Yasser. Please feel free to ask your question. Hello. Hi. Yes, I just have a quick question. Uh, given the specificities of uh, former Soviet Union and Israel, are the results of your model applicable to other mass migrations of uh, labor in other countries? That's a, that's a very good question. Um, and there, there are indeed many things that make this a, a peculiar episode. Uh, one of them is the, 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 the sheer size of it, how quickly it arrived, and importantly, the fact that since minute one, these immigrants had the same uh, rights in the labor market as, as, as natives. Um, so that's a good question. I mean, I think that some of the, the themes underlying these patterns are broadly applicable to, to immigrants that move to a new place and that, uh, that they plan on being there for a long time. Um, in fact, the, the previous work that I mentioned does some related analysis on Portugal and Canada, and it's a very different place, but the results are the, the fact that immigrants gradually uh, get, go to better paying firms is, is also something that comes up there. Um, we have a longer time series, so, 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 so compared to those papers, we have 25 years of data since the arrival of the first cohorts, so we can document how this actually eventually closes up. Um, but yeah, I think that overall, this uh, this has important peculiarities that I agree. I wouldn't claim that it, this would be the same everywhere else. Also, I I, I, I mentioned it before these immigrants were very highly educated, even if it was hard mm. to, to to transfer the skills that they had learned. Uh, but uh, the the themes, I, I mean, I would be comfortable thinking that broadly are applicable to other contexts. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I actually have two questions for you myself. So the first question, I think, um, 
is more related to uh, migration networks. So basically, mm -hmm. in, in, in the beginning of your presentation, you mentioned that sometimes when immigrants arrive to the country, they don't really have a network with natives yet, so it, it might take a while. But what, what some of the literature suggests and what, and what we observe is that they might have a, a, a migration network, so they might have people who, for example, in this case, people who already came from the former Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. and, and so basically they act as, as their, their, their local network in a way. And I wonder if this is how people or, or immigrants initially choose which uh, firms to go to, you know? Do you think this is something that could be? That's, yeah, that's something that could definitely happen. And, um, you know, in our plans to study the network channel, I think that, 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 that this is something that we want to, to, to look at, especially because when you read the, uh, the, the, the more qualitative literature on this episode, there's a lot of uh, descriptions about the uh, Soviet Jews having very strong networks in terms of family and friends. And a lot of, you know, I show you the time series, there's a very high spike in 1990. And a lot of those that came after was actually following friends and family from the early wave. Um, so I think that what you say is perfectly plausible. And it's something that, that we could uh, actually try to document with this data. Yeah. That, that could be, I think that could be extremely interesting, yeah, to also explore this channel of migration networks. Yeah, thank you. And the second question is whether you uh, observe heterogeneity of effects by industry. So if you see different integration paths, if you look at, at different types of industries. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question in line with, with, um, with what Jeremy was suggesting, we haven't done, to be honest, we haven't done much with the industry side and, and, and all your questions uh, are suggesting that, that we do, because I think that, uh, yeah, we might find something interesting if it's very different mm -hmm. in, in some industries yeah. and, and others. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Thank you very much. I think uh, Giuseppe, you wanted to ask one last question. Yeah, I have a very last question, which actually relates to uh, several uh, earlier questions. So uh, most of the uh, earliest questions, uh, especially, are focused on the uh, of the of so on the skill composition side. But one of the results that you highlight is that the uh, wage catching up is driven mostly by the uh, firm specific premium. So I'm thinking whether um, you know the the um, the premium of the firm could be related to this network's effect such that, uh, you know, an increasing uh, presence of, uh, uh, of Jew uh, from, from of Jew works from, from the Soviet Union could actually affect the, the rent sharing dynamics of the firm and hence this, uh, this premium. Yes, that's a, that's a good question. Um... One way to look at it would, would be similar to the previous literature that has studied the uh, wage gaps through this type of uh, models would be to allow um, the firm premia within a firm to be different for immigrants and natives. And that's something that we could estimate and that uh, it's also something that we want to do. Uh, previous, the, the previous literature seems to suggest that Based on the previous literature, my prior is that, there, that, that those will be very highly correlated um, given the, the findings on other wage gaps. But yes, that's, that's a good point that, that it's on our, on our to-do list that I keep referring to. <laughs> that, yeah, yeah. I, I was asking this, especially because you show that as many firms have at least some, uh, uh, some of these uh, uh, immigrant workers so even like the 50% uh, share is, is already pretty high. So, okay, uh, thank you. Thanks a lot. Let me, let me just briefly introduce the, the, the next speaker. So uh, slide. So uh, we will be back on the uh, 11th of, uh, of January in 2021. Uh, we will be updating our schedule um, very soon, so um, please stay tuned, and uh, if you have any other questions, don't hesitate to 
contact our speaker. Thanks a lot again, Jaime, and thanks everybody for participating to today's session. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>